All right, as we usually do, we will focus in on some aspects of today's Pasha, and hopefully get some insight that is directly pertinent to ourselves. And uh, again, if anyone fails to understand something that I say because of the language uh, barrier, please do not hesitate and ask. He's an expert. He's an expert. We have a lot of experts. So, so we'll have to, um, but, uh, because uh, there's no point of guessing. <coughs> The Pasha is Pasha Toildis. And this is the, the Pasha in the Chumash Breshis that deals with Yitzchok exclusively. In general, the Chumash Breshis uh, in general, uh, I think I pointed this out to you months before. <coughs> the Chumash Breshis is unique it almost exclusively speaks about stories of people. There is hardly any, any mitzvahs in there. There's one mitzvah, maybe two mitzvahs, Gita Nosha, you're going to learn mitzvahs, Mila. That's about it in the whole Chumash. It's all stories. The story of creation, the story of Rodom, Kain, Rehevel, Mabel, Noyach, and so forth. And then Rom Yitzhaku Yankiv, of course, is the major. But these stories, as you know, and we know, you sure learned already, and uh, 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 explains that uh, these stories carry in them um, the deepest secrets of the Torah. The Chumash Bereshis is called Sefer Hayosho. Sefer Hayosho, the book of the righteous. Because it speaks about the Yishorim. Um, there is right in the beginning of the Parsha. There's something that clearly states a very important insight. It says, Eilu told the ben Avraham, Avraham holy the Yitzchok. On this posuk, I'm sure you learn the many, many different comments. Rashi has a very long discussion on this posuk. The word toildois literally means the generations, the births. As Rashi translates the word toildois, that he refers to Yankiv and Aesop. Toildois, the, the children. The word toildois also has a secondary meaning, which means occurrences or something that illustrates the life quality and the lifestyle of the person that was called Toildis. So if you learn this posuk, Eli Toildis Yitzhak ben Avram, these are the these are the expressions of the life quality of Yitzhak ben Avram. What is it? Avram hated the Yitzhak. Avram gave birth to Yitzhak. In other words, this principle that Avram gave birth to Yitzchok, this already expresses the life quality and the life, the meaning of the life of Yitzchok and Avram. What's, what does this mean? Like everything else in Torah has many 
ramifications. But I want to bring it down to our own time. We live today in what's called the modern era. And if we would, we would um, pay attention to um, the common, the popular view of the world, especially in the modern era, which we are all exposed to. And this is why I, I make a special point that we should understand and see the, the how we differ, how the Torah differs from that, and how this is um, 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 meaningless as far as we are concerned. The way the world history is viewed to the modern eye, there were all, all there were different periods. There is the prehistoric period. There is the ancient period. There is the, the Greek and Roman period. There is the Renaissance period, or the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, the Renaissance. And the way this is viewed and the way this is explained is that these, well, each one of these periods is completely dissociated. You know what dissociated means? unattached, unconnected to the period before it. And we come to our modern era, the modern person has a completely different view of things. He understands things, the world, well, infinitely better than, than his predecessors. Look, he's got all that technology. He knows that the earth is round. He has no, no doubt about it. And look at those, all those uh, guys that, that uh, you know, that were in a completely different era and they, they were completely a uh, uh, different world. So that there is absolutely, there is no continuity from the beginning of time till today. There was no continuity. Each era each period claimed the, the world to itself, essentially. Yes, we learn something from them, you learn something from them, but basically it's a new world. We, the Jewish people, have a contiguous time. Even though we also went through a lot, a lot of historical experiences and we changed with the time in the sense that we lived with the Romans, we lived with the Greeks, <laughs> we lived with the, with the, uh, with the um, Egyptians, we lived with the Babylonians, we lived throughout the whole history. And we had to deal with all of these people. As a matter of fact, we were in exile in each one of these countries, Babylonians and the, and the um, uh, um, Iranians, what's now called the Iranians, the Persians, the, Persians, the Egyptians, the, the, you name it. We had to deal with all of them. And we essentially remain the same people. We spoke different languages, perhaps we changed somewhat our attire, our clothing, our uh, diet, but we were the same people. And we always pride ourselves, and we always describe ourselves, who are we? We are the children of Avram, Isaac, Yitzchok, and Yankee. And we, we are the 12 tribes from Yankee. There is no break. No matter what the changes are, no matter what the circumstances, how the circumstances change, what world we live in. And this is 
is right there in the first post. Yitzchok was the first man in whole human history that began a contiguous chain of 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 a human of human of human history. Yitzchok ben Avram, Avram heyle des Yitzchok. Yitzchok, as we will talk and we'll discuss, Yitzchok was was a very different than Avram. His mode of avoider, his life was very different than that of Avram. But what? How did he describe himself? What did he stand for? That Avram is Yitzchok. He didn't say, Avram, oh, you are from the old country. I have a different way to live. I see things differently. I'm going to start a new approach to things. With all the, the differences in Yitzchok, he, des- he described in the Torah, what is the toilless Yitzchok? Torah, what is the life quality, lifestyle? How would you describe it? The first thing is that Avram, he always recognized for all times that Avram here is Yitzchok. And then Yankiv recognized that Yitzchok here is Yankiv. Yankiv ben Yitzchok. And this goes to all the generations, all the way to our own time, that no matter what Ayidin's experience is, no matter where he finds himself, where he wakes up and says, oh, I'm Jewish, what does that mean? The Rebbe once in the Sikha, we have a lot of Russian speaking um, people over here who experience the Russian background a little bit. You're very young, but you know it too, a little bit what it is. The Rebbe once very, very bitterly, very painfully said, so I spoke about the Russian young, young children. He says there's a child who doesn't know never anything by no fault of his whatsoever. And he screams out and he says, what, what, what kind of thing is this Torah? He never heard of it. Everybody knows what, no, not everybody. Most of you know what Shtot Torah means. You know what it means? You do? How do you know? We hear a lot of Russian. We hear a lot of Russian. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> what kind of thing is this? And this young kid who screams out, oh, oh, I never heard of it, I don't know what kind of odd, oddity is that, is also a Ben Avram Yitzhak young kid. And that is the definition of him being Jewish. What does it mean to be a Jew? A descendant of Avram Yitzhak young kid. That's the first thing. He doesn't have to start from scratch. He doesn't have to start from the beginning. He's, he's connected right there. Not only is he connected, but he represents Avram Yitzhak. Taylor is Yitzhak and Avram. What is Yitzhak's accomplishment? Avram here is Yitzhak. Yitzhak goes out and makes an announcement. You know what my task in life is to establish Avram here is Yitzhak. And that is true about every year. Every There's an interesting Indian regarding the obvious, something of a very deep insight that we can learn. Avram, Yitzhak, and Yankiv. Avram had a son, Yishmoel. Yitzhak had a son, Aesop. So, it says in Mephoshim and Exodus that Avraham, his avoid was Midas Achesed, Midas O'Aharon. I'm assuming you, you heard about this already. His way that he served Hashem was through Ahavon and Chesed. He, he served people, he brought people into his home, and so forth. This was his thing. Avraham stood up and pleaded pleaded, means he prayed, he, uh, he asked Hashem to save, he tried to save Zdoim. This was Avram, Avram Midas Achesed. 
Yitzchok, on the other hand, was very, very different than Avram. He was Midas HaGvura. Pachad Yitzchok. Yitzchok's Yitzhak, way of avoiding was through Yira. Through Yira, through awe and fear. His avoider was very disciplined avoider. Not chesed, but gvura. Completely different, different approach to life. Mesir Nefesh, he was an oil at Mime, he was a korm oil on the Mizbeya. I was his fault. Yankev, again, was completely different than Yitzhak and Avram. Yankiv lived in farm lands. He worked. He worked for a living, so to speak. <laughs> he, he, you learn, Mr. Shem. He, he uh, worked in the lover's house. He, he was exposed to to all the, the doings in the world. He had twelve sons. Each one of them was very different from the other. So Yankiv, it says, Yankiv's mida, the mida, that was the basic principle that that can describe so to speak his life was called Midas Atiferes. Each one of the others was different than the other. Then we take the other side. There is Avram had the son Yishmoel. And Yishmoel was also Midas Achasid. Yitzhak had the son Asov. And Nesav was also Midas Angvura. He was a warrior. Not like Yankiv. He was, he was a, a tough man. He was like, you know, the king came through with his toughness and, and, and fighting for, him, for, for, for his position. This was Esau. So, from that perspective, Esau reflected Yitzchok more than Yankiv did. And Yishmoel reflected Avram more than Yitzhak did. Yet we know that not only is Yitzhak closer to Avram, but Yitzhak is considered Avram's son. Yishmoel is not even considered Avram's son. I mean, he was physically, biologically, was he was son, but he's not an heir. He didn't inherit Avram's of Rome's place in the world history. Didn't represent of Rome. The Torah says, the Yitzvah you call El Chazorah. The fact that you have children will be reflected only in the fact that you have Yitzvah, not, not Ishmael. And the same thing, Esau and Yankiv. Yankiv is Yitzvah's son. Yankiv carried on Yitzvah's life, not Esau. What does this tell us? It tells us that the principles of Yiddishkeit and the principles of Avram Yitzhak Liyankiv have a, an internal quality that 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 they represent, that they stand for. The periphery, periphery means the outside, what it looks like. Whether you 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 do things in the Ava form of the Yira form or in the Ferris form, that's up to the person himself. There are many different ways to serve Hashem. But what does connect Abram Yitzhak ben Avram, Avram, holy des Yitzchok. What connect? What connects Yitzchok to Avram? Is a much deeper principle. Not the the manner in which they they act, the manner in which they serve Hashem. Whereas Yishmoel. And Esau, they replicated, they imitated their 
and Avram and Yitzchok on the external level. So that Ishmael did not really, did not really relate, did not understand the real message, the real principle of Rome. He only saw the external, the, the, the Ahava aspect. But he didn't understand that, that internally, that the real life quality, the real meaning behind Avram's Ahava meant, uh, meant Avodah Hashem. And that's why Yishmoel completely perverted. What perverted means? He, he, he misrepresented, misunderstood completely what Avram stood for even though he continued on in the same vein of Chesed. And the same thing, Aesop, he picked up only on the, on the external mode, but not on the principle that, that was behind it, what Aesop stood for. And here is where I want to elaborate on this clarify also based on the past and the week. This is actually based on on the Rebbe's Sikhs, a lot of Sikhs in Bahn. You know, several Sikhs over the many years that the Rebbe spoke. <coughs> Yitzchok's life, first of all, Yitzchok to start with, his name, Yitzchok, means to laugh. Laugh means simcha, joy. On the other hand, we say Yitzchok, Yitzchok joy. Yitzchok was a court on the, on the, on the Mizbeach. Where is it time to have time to laugh? He's got no time to laugh. He's serious. And his very name means laughter. Simcha. When he was born, it says in the previous Pasha, that the whole world was blessed with joy. And then, in today's Pasha we see, which you already learned, very interesting union. First, we see that Yitzchok, the success that Yitzchok had simply in worldly, in worldly wealth, in acquisition, was so enormous, way beyond that of Avram or Yankir. <coughs> you learn that there was, there was a famine and all the world was, was starving and Yitzchok, Yitzchok's fields produced without limit. He was, became so wealthy that the king, the king of the land was jealous of him. He said to him, you, you can't be with us anymore because you're creating havoc in my land. People are looking at you and they're looking at me and they say, <laughs> what can the king you say? Look at this man. And he asked Yitzhak to move out. So this, here is a man whose avoida is very restrictive, right? Gvura, restrictive and, and serious. And yet his success is, is beyond limit. Right. Then there is another Indian that the Torah tells us that, and this is really one of the things that superficially seems to be very odd, what is this all about? There's a whole parsha in the Torah that speaks about well digging. You know what well digging is? Oh. Well digging? No, you also don't know. Well digging or well digging? Well digging. Digging oh, for, for water. water. To get water from under the ground. 
whole Pasha, Pasha speaks about it. That after Yitzhak was driven out of, of Gror, he had to move out. Before he moved out, he opened up all the wells that Abraham dug and the Egyptians, not the Egyptians, the Philistines, they covered them and Yitzhak opened them up again. And then Yitzhak went out, out of Gror and looked for water. He found one well and they took him away from him. He found another well, they took him away from him. And then he found the third one and said, ah, now we'll be able to settle down. Did you, did you know about this, this Pasha? <coughs> what? Did he pick up a rock that no one picked up like easily? Is that him? No, that's that's Yaakov. That's the next thing. They they dug wells, they dug into the ground, and they and they found water. And it, the 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 main thing is you have to think about the Torah, the Torah, which is so concise and everything is meaningful dedicates a whole Pasha talking about digging of these wells. Getting the water out of the ground. This is Yitzhak Savoyda. This is what Yitzhak was busy with, digging wells. Yitzhak ben Avram, Avram heard this Yitzhak. Avram was going around teaching the whole world about, about Hashem, about God. Yitzhak was digging wells. <laughs> It, 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 it's clearly there is there is something else here. It's brought down. It says that in, in the Torah relates to three wells that Yitzhak dug. Three and. It's explained that these three wells represent the three Bote Hamigdash, the three base Migdash. You know the way we have the first base Hamigdash, which was destroyed, the second base Hamigdash, which was destroyed, and the third base Hamigdash is the one that we are waiting for any any moment. Each one of these wells represented represents the Bote Migdash. That's why the first one, they were overjoyed. They were very happy to find this one. But then the Philistines came and took and fought, fought over it and took it away from them. The second Bezamidosh was also destroyed. And then the third Bezamidosh, this is what's going to stand forever. And the way the Torah describes it is that Yitzhak said, Hirchim Hashem Lonu. And Hashem gave us a broad area. He broadened, He opened us up. He allowed us now to to flourish, to succeed, and to grow. So, what I want to understand, I want to explain. Where is this? What is the significance of that? And how is it, how is it that Yitzchok is joy, and Yitzchok is actually carrying on Avram Savoida? Yitzchok and Avram. Avram hated this Yitzchok. Where is Avram and Yitzchok? They, they don't see that. They don't seem to be following the same steps at all. Yitzchok's avoider. Again, if something that you don't understand, please stop me. Yitzchok's avoider, the way of his avoider, was actually illustrated by these digging of wells. How does one, how do we dig for wells, for water? We dig into the ground and we go sometimes very, very deep. And as long as we are digging, it's only work, 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 work. There's nothing there. You can be digging and digging and digging. 
and you can be discouraged <laughs> whatever nothing is happening. You're going down deeper and deeper into the ground and you still continue to dig. And then suddenly you make you take the next shovel full of of earth, all of a sudden there is water flowing. And once you find water, the water flows on its own. You don't have to push the water, you don't have to get the water out. It's there. It flows by itself. And this flow is constant. It never stops. It's not like something got you. You build a house. You build a house. After you build a house, you have to maintain it. This breaks. That breaks. You have to renovate. You have to change things. It's not going to stand forever. Water flowing, once you found the water, it's called what we call living water. Maim Chai, it's called in the Maim Chai, living water. Because they have their own life. They're constantly flowing. <clears throat> Avraham did the same thing that Yitzhak did. Yitzhak did the same thing that Avraham did, but in two different ways. Very different. We will understand it <coughs> from from our own from our own experiences. When a person learns, let's say he learns a piece of Gemara, a piece of Chumash, Mishnayos. So he has now accumulated. He has now that which he learned. He learned this mission, so he knows this mission. He learned another mission, he knows this man, the other mission. So he's, he's actually progressing, but he's progressing at a normal pace. The amount of time, the amount of work, the amount of learning that he did, that's what he has. This is the avoider uh, according to the way Avram did things. He had people come and he taught them about Hashem and so forth. Whatever people he had a contact with, whatever he was able to teach, that's what the, you know, his accomplishment was. Yitzchok had a different, a different avoider. Like we said before, that you dig and you dig and you dig and it's in dark and you don't see anything. Not like if you learn a Mishnah, so I have something. By the way, you learn a piece of Chumash, I have this. There, <clears throat> during the time that you're fighting, that you're digging, you may be completely in the dark. But then when you break through, then you have an enormous breakthrough. It's called, you, you break through the darkness, you break through the, the limitations of the world. And then the breakthrough is not only that you're no longer in the dark, and now you have water to drink, but the water flows on its own. In, in, in Avoida, in terms of, of Yiddishkeit, what this means is we have, we all have seichel, we all have our minds, the intelligence, and we have our hearts. And as we learn, there's, we, we understand a little bit what we learn. That's what we take with our seichel. And this understanding, we accumulate, we learn more and more, and, we learn, we, we, and that way we know more and more, we have more and more toilet. But then there is an entirely different phase, a different part, a different side to this whole avoid. And that is when we are actually fighting, so to speak, resisting our 
learning is something which is pleasant, right? We, we are accumulating knowledge. But then there is also, we are fighting the darkness. We are fighting the darkness of the Yetzirah. That fight isn't a very pleasant one. That fight is something that causes us a lot of tsar, a lot of aggravation, a lot of unhappiness. And many times we say, we say, I can't fight it anymore. I can't stand it anymore. We're ready to, to throw the shovel in. This is like digging a well in the dark. But what happens is that with this, in this fight, in this, in this challenge, and in this work in the darkness, every shovel, every shovel that we dig up, become closer to the source of the water. We still don't see it, but we become closer to the source of the water as we are digging. And eventually, there is what's called a breakthrough. And a breakthrough means all of a sudden, things begin to make sense. All of a sudden, we understand that which yesterday we couldn't possibly understand. It didn't make any sense. All of a sudden, it makes sense by itself. It's as if it's not like oh, somebody explained to me something, I figured something out. No. Things that that couldn't make sense yesterday, today I don't have, I have any problem. I don't need to explain it. I don't have any problem with it. It becomes bright. This is like water flowing directly from the source. This is like the intelligence, the wisdom flowing directly from our neshama. We see a completely different world. There is no question we have every mode of avoider. We have avoider of Avram, avoider of Yankim, avoider of Yitzchak. But <coughs> particularly, particularly in our days, and particularly in the days of the Golas, the biggest demand is the avoider of Yitzchak. Because in the days of the Golas, like the the the, the, the Russian Yidden, those who are from Russia. Again, you were young, but I can tell you, I myself remember. The difficulty in Russia was not just that you were afraid of a KGB, and you couldn't give your children any chinuch. That was plenty difficult, and you couldn't get kosher food and all those things. You were scared for your life. But the most the most challenging difficulty was that you had no hope of ever changing. What is the hope that you that you ever be able to that you were able to be able to, to bring your children up to Yitoyra and Yiddishkeit? There's no hope. A possibility. You can hide and hide and hide, but eventually you have to go out of the house. And there's no way, no hope. And yet the Yidin, how did they live in Russia? They did, they continued to do in the darkness, to do what they needed to do. How, what's going to happen tomorrow? And how is it ever going to happen, so to speak, 10 or 15 years from now? We don't know. We have no hope whatsoever. I don't remember if I related to you. This was something which I myself experienced. I was a little child, and my father, Rasholim, used to wake me up in the middle of the night, like 3 o'clock in the morning, 
when all the neighbors were sleeping, were quiet, because we were all surrounded, we all lived in, in one apartment, and the neighbors all around. All the neighbors were quiet. Why are you laughing? That's the way the way you lived in Russia. There was no separate. Uh, <laughs> a family lived in a room, not in a in an apartment. They lived in a room, we had, and then each room was another family. And the next door, by, across you know, from uh, through our wall, was a goya. Through our wall, from this there was a goya. It was all very dangerous. He used to wake me up in the middle of the night. I was, you know, half asleep. He'd throw some water in my face. He would sit down at the table and take up an old seat that we didn't have in all of this chart. We had some kind of an old torn up cedar. That's what we had. That was our treasure. And he would point out the alibis from that torn seed. This is how I was taught alibis by my father also. So you would ask him at that time and say, what are you doing? What do you hope to accomplish with this? You, I mean, what do you what do you think? By teaching this alibis from the torn seed that he's going, to, what what is he going to know? And how is he going to be able to use it? That this is the challenge of the goals. This is the goals. Each one of us has the, our own goals. We have to understand. You have to always remember that beyond this golos, beyond the darkness, beyond that which is challenging to you, there's a bright light. There's a lot of fresh, living water. There's an ashama. And that which today is a dark and, and, and uh, difficult to relate to, I can't understand what it is all about. By digging this well, event ultimately there is a breakthrough. And I'm sure each one of, we, of us here experienced this from time to time. Because there are many small breakthroughs. But each one can say, wow, you know, just about a week ago I thought this is impossible. I didn't make any sense. And now everything, not this make, really makes sense. Where did, the, where did that sense come from? Not because I figured out something, but because I have a different view, I have a different, a different light, different approach, different recognition. Where is the truth coming from? Is the truth coming from the rock, from the, from the Gashmis, from the physical world, or is the truth coming from some kind of a spiritual, from a godly source? And my, my view changes completely. All of a sudden, things make sense. Make sense. This is what's called, this is the Abedus Yitzchok. This is why Yitzchok is called Yitzchok, laughter, joy, simcha. Because when there is that breakthrough, there is no limit to the joy. When a person works, and he and he's successful. He he goes to a job, and he gets paid. And he comes home with his paycheck and can pay his rent and can buy milk for the children. It's fine. But when is a person overwhelmed with joy? When there is some type of, some type of a of a big windfall of success beyond the beyond that with the immediate need, beyond the work that he did. That's the joy that comes with the, with the avoid of Yitzchuk. That's why Yitzchuk is called Yitzchuk. This, this, and this hard work ultimately re results in real joy, in real simcha, in real light and, and flowing water. Long. I want to speak about us a little bit more, but just um, 
I want to show another aspect of Yitzhak's life so we can see how it all comes together. You know that Yitzhak and Yifke had two sons, had twins, Yankiv and Esau, as I mentioned before. Yankiv and Esau were brothers, not only brothers, they were twins. But these twins fought before they were born. You learned this, right? They were two different worlds before they were even born. They were completely different. They, one is pulling in one direction, one is pulling in another, pulling in another direction. There is a, this is a kind of a, on the lighter side. Um, it's a, the Torah says that, he, that Rivke, the, the children were fighting her belly. I said to Abon in Bikir, but they were fighting in her belly. And Rashi says, what was, how did she, what, did, what was the telling, what, what was she experiencing? That when she passed by, by the, by Bismedrish of Shemba Aver, Yankee was trying to get out. So therefore she thought, oh, this kid in there, he wants to learn, he's learning to eat. He smells it, he feels it, this is a holy place, he wants to go. But then she walked by, by a place of idols, of Abed Zara. All of a sudden, he's trying to get out. She says, hey, this kid wants to go to Abed Zara. So, so she said, what kind of kid is this? He wants to learn to eat, he wants to Abed Zara. I can't, I can't take such a kid. This is what bothered her. He says, what do I need a kid like that for? He, he can make, make, make up his mind. Whatever it is, he give him Klippa, give him a Vidazora, he wants a Vidazora, give him Kedusha, he wants Kedusha. That, that kind of kid I can't deal with. So she went, right, so Atena Khalidus Hashem, she went to Bismedesh and asked, please tell me what's going on in my belly. And the Novi told her, you should know that there are two kids in there. Two separate nations. She says, ah, two separate men. I'll accept that. I can live with that. As long as they're not crazy kids. <laughs> He's not going all over the place. He's got, I have one kid like that. Well, okay. You need to make a shit. I can, I can, I can live. That, that, that calmed her down. I can carry it through. As long as he's not jumping all over the place. He's got one, one, one line of thought. In any case, I said this on the lighter side. So, <clears throat> so the question is, how come? What is the meaning that Yankee and Esau were twins in the same belly by Rifke the Tutkonis? How did that happen? Where does Esau come into this whole picture? This was all Kedusha, this was all holy. All of a sudden there was an ace of in there. And there are more questions associated with this. I, I said this is a lot of Rebbe Sikhs and all. I just want to make one short point. The function of ace of Indeed, he was a he, he, he was a shofar domi. He was a murderer, as it says. When he was born, he was red. So Rashi says, I'm sure you 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 learned that this was a semen she a shofar domi. This was a sign that he's going to spill blood. He actually killed people and people. Yeah, Nimrod. You learn about it. He killed Nimrod. He he robbed people. He he took women from under their husbands. All kinds of things you learn later on. Um, and uh, <coughs> and, and um, the <coughs> where does he come to to Rivke? How is it that Rivke should have such a such a son, Yitzchok? The 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 objective, the function of Esau, the union of Sadat, there is such an Esau, 
is why why was it, how how did Ace of come into being so to speak? It is that Ace of in fact has hidden hidden capacity, hidden strength, such hidden strength that enables him to overcome and to break through the opposite, to break out of clip, to transform. Transform means to change around. Translate, can you have a word? Transform? Transformatie, right? Transform, change around the clip and completely the opposite. Except that Esau needed Yankiv to, to help him. This is why the Yidin, it's our job, the Jewish job, to teach the Goyim. But ultimately, they will, after we teach them, they will be able to tra- be trans- transformed. This is... You mean that because, because King David came from Rus, from... No, from like they had like a certain type of nature or something, but like King David wasn't able to harness his nature or change it. Because he had like a little rudy attitude, you know, nature. Yeah. yeah. So, the, the objective, the object of Esau, this is the same thing I can mention before about, I was talking about Yitzchok, digging wells. You dig into the ground. But what is the purpose of digging into the ground is to get fresh water that exists only deep, deep down into the ground. The deeper in the ground the water is, the fresher and purer it is. Water that's on the surface can be contaminated. Water that you dig up from very deep down into the, into the ground, from deep in the mountains, these are, this is water that has no contaminants, it's the best water. Today they bottle this water and they sell it in bottles because this is like really the best water. So this is where Esau comes in into, into Yitzchok's into Yitzchok's home, into Yitzchok's life, into it by, by Rivke. And this is where Esau and Yankiv are brothers because Yankiv ultimately has the job to bring out the best that's contained in Yitzhak Esau. It says in Hasidus that in fact Esau has a higher root, a higher source than Yanki. It also says that in the Tanya. Right. Right. He has a higher source than Yanki. And because he has a higher source than Yanki, when he comes down into this world, he becomes completely dark and, con- con- and concealed, then Yankiv has the job to, to undig it, to reveal it. Okay, having said all that, I want to come back to ourselves over here. We should understand where we are coming from, and we should understand our own difficulties. We should not be disappointed when we learn and we learn and we learn and it doesn't make sense. I don't understand. There is that fresh water, there is that, that spring in you, deep down. And every time that we, that we labor, every time that we fight, we break through, as I mentioned before, Each one of us here, I'm sure, had experienced minor breakthroughs. All of a sudden, I feel comfortable with it. I feel comfortable saying Moideani. When you come from from far away, you say, Moideani, I don't know what I'm doing. All of a sudden, I feel comfortable. It makes sense. I feel comfortable watching Negavasa. I feel comfortable davening, I feel comfortable when I'm feeling. All that is a breakthrough. All that reveals our true selves, reveals what our neshama is, reveals what makes sense, what we are comfortable. With. 
So there was this which we learn. We can give a test. I know what the, what the meaning of this word is, what the meaning of this word is. This is this is more or less, so to speak, on, on the relative comparison. It is like the superficial level. This is what we learn with our seichel. But that which we accomplish through through the challenges, by by digging and by stubborn and being stubborn and going further and further and saying, I'm going to work hard until I break through, until I get a sense of it, until I feel at home in Torah. That is the real, that's the real work. Ultimately, everyone, every yid has to, is capable and has to try to feel completely at home in Torah. He knows a lot, he knows a little, that doesn't, that doesn't define it. But he has to feel, it makes sense, I feel comfortable with him, I feel warm with him. I feel the holiness of him. I feel privileged and, and, and blessed in having this opportunity. That, that everyone is capable of. If he doesn't feel it, it's it it is there, and he has to. And the more he works, the more he digs, the more he will appreciate it. Until it becomes something which flows directly from him. The Gemara says, the Torah is called, the Torah is described, is, is referred to as Torah Hashem as Hashem's Torah. And the Torah is also described as Torah Soi, as the Torah belonging to the person who learns it. Torah Soi, his Torah. Because even though when we first start to learn, we're learning Torah Hashem, oh, that's what the Hashem says, that's what the Moshe Rabbeinu said. It's not me, I, I'm, I'm out of it. I'm just, I'm, I'm just listening. Oh, that's what he said, okay. I'm like an outsider. But eventually, we, become, we realize that, yes, it's not, it's not a, a strange thing. It's something which is, my only Shoma says that. This is my turn. And I can, I can perfectly relate to it. When we first learn, we need to understand what that means. God created Shemayim Vahoritz. What does it mean? After a while, after we learn and we think, and we go through a lot of internal challenges, we say, of course God created the world. How else? It's stupid to think. I, think, I can't think any other way. I can't think of it in any other way. The Dana becomes your tale. It's no longer God's tale. It's your tale. This is, this is the way I see it. This is a breakthrough. This is a light that comes directly from the Neshama. This is not something that we figured out. Only the Neshama can, can have such an insight, such a recognition. Hashem should bless you all, which should help us all to have these breakthroughs more often and breakthroughs more quickly with less difficulties, with less challenges. And ultimately, we should break through the darkness of the whole world and bring Mashiach. Amen.